Good morning. Welcome to Trinity St. Stephen. Welcome to all those who are here worshiping with us today and those of us watching on YouTube and on Eastlink. I'm going to invite Garth Rayner up first to do a congregational announcement and then I'll go on to the other announcements. everyone. This is the second week that I've read this announcement. Um, I'm the chairman of the search committee that was set up at our last congregational meeting of this church, and I'm here today to announce that the search committee is prepared to make a report on and a proposal from their work over the past several months. The committee has scheduled a congregational meeting for Tuesday, February the 15th, or 16th if there's a storm, and we hope not. It'll be at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary of the church. Because this is a meeting and not a worship service, attendees will be required to wear masks, observe distancing, and show proof of double vaccination. The search committee wants to achieve a good turnout of members and adherents of Trinity St. Stephen's United Church. And we would I'd like you to pre-register with the office, although we understand that maybe Dr. Strang has, has extended our limits and we may not be restricted to 50 anymore, so, but we'd still like to know whether you're coming and we'd have a, an indication of how many to prepare for. Um, if you need a drive, would you please let Erica in the office know and we'll try to find you a drive to get you to the meeting. The meeting, hopefully, uh, will be under 40 minutes. It'll be chaired by Kay Ruth Gamble, who is Region 15 liaison and representative on our search committee. You might want to arrive a little early to allow for the checking of vaccinations. And one last item, uh, in case there's a request for a secret ballot, would you please bring a writing instrument, a pen or a pencil, in, in case you might need that. Hoping to see you on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, we welcome this morning Herma Van Zust, who will be joining us as our guest speaker. And thank you, and thank you to you for leading us in worship. As uh, Garth alluded to, Dr. Strang has raised restrictions a little bit, just a touch, but enough that we're going to be able to come back to worship in person uh, with greater numbers. And the choir will be back in the uh, stalls next week, which is wonderful and exciting news for all of us, especially those of us who have been singing at home. I missed it by one week, so I'm here by myself. Um, but the, just to let people know, too, if the, with regard to winter weather conditions, please do listen to CFTA radio for the announcements if you're uncertain about whether church will be going ahead. Um, Eileen Henwood will be celebrating her 100th birthday on February 25th. What a wonderful milestone. Um, please extend her birthday wishes in the form of cards by mail or drop off at number 121 Gladstone Avenue in Amherst as Eileen is currently in hospital and her family will take the cards to her to read. Um, just a reminder of next Sunday is the congregational financial meeting after the service and congregants who wish to attend will remain in the sanctuary for this meeting. And finally, on Sunday, February 27th, we'll be joining First Baptist Church for a joint Black History Month service with the guest speaker, Reverend J. Lennett J. Anderson. Sounds like it's gonna be a wonderful service. We acknowledge that the lands on which we live and worship are the historic territories of the Mi'kmaq people. We seek to live with respect on the land and in peace and friendship with its people. Let us welcome into our lives the light of Christ and commit to sharing this light with our family, friends, in our community, and in our world. Please stand as we uh, read together the uh, gathering words it's printed in your bulletins. We have been invited to come to this place to gather as a community. 
We have accepted the invitation with gratitude and praise that we are free to do so. Together as one, we take these moments to welcome the renewal that is available to us into our minds, our hearts, and spirits. As the lengthening days bring more light, we gratefully receive the light of God that shows us on our way forward. The hymn is 708, My Lord, What a Morning. Let's pray together the prayer of confession. Gracious God, we humbly bring to you whatever might stand between you and us, between ourselves and others, between us and all that you have created. We acknowledge that we have taken your gifts for granted and misused them. We acknowledge that we have been unkind in thought, word, and action. We acknowledge that we have not shared the grace and love you so abundantly give. Help us to be gracious to ourselves and to one another, forgiving freely as you do. Amen. Although we repeatedly receive affirmation that nothing can stand between ourselves and the source of life with God, we feel that way when we feel that we have not lived up to our potential in some way. The moment we feel that is the moment we can free ourselves and allow that feeling to dissolve into the love and grace we know is present at all times. The peace of Christ be with you. And 
someday we'll be able to uh, greet, our, greet each other in uh, closer ways. <laughs> Hugs, maybe. The first reading is from the prophet Jeremiah, uh, 31, reading verses 31 through 37. The Lord said, the time will surely come when I will make a new agreement with the people of Israel and Judah. It will be different from the agreement I made with their ancestors when I led them out of Egypt. Although I was their God, they broke that agreement. Here is the new agreement that I, the Lord, will make with the people of Israel. I will write my laws on their hearts and minds. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they have to teach one another to obey me. I, the Lord, promise that all of them will obey me, ordinary people and rulers alike. I will forgive their sins and forget the evil things they have done. I am the Lord, all-powerful. I command the sun to give light each day, the moon and stars to shine at night, the ocean to roar. I will never forget to give those commands and I will never let Israel stop being a nation. I, the Lord, have spoken. Can you measure the heavens? Can you explore the depths of the earth? That's how hard it would be for me to reject Israel forever, even though they have sinned. I, the Lord, have spoken. The psalm is Psalm number one. The title is The Way to Happiness. God blesses those people who refuse evil advice and won't follow sinners or who join in sneering at God. Instead, the law of the Lord makes them happy and they will think about it day and night. They are like trees growing beside a stream, trees that produce fruit in season and always have leaves. Those people succeed in everything that they do. That isn't true of those who are evil because they are like straw blown in the wind. Sinners won't have an excuse on the day of judgment and they won't have a place with the people of God. The Lord protects everyone who follows him, but the wicked follow a road that leads to ruin. And finally, the reading from Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. And this is uh, Luke's version of the Beatitudes. Uh, Matthew writes them, and those are usually the ones that are quoted, but uh, Luke also records his version. Jesus and his apostles went down from the mountain and came to some flat, level ground. Many other disciples were there to meet him. Large crowds of people from all over Judea, Jerusalem, and the coastal cities of Tyre and Sidon were there too. These people had come to listen to Jesus and to be healed of their diseases. All who were troubled by evil spirits were also healed. Everyone was trying to touch Jesus because the power was going out from him and healing them all. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, God will bless you, you people who are poor. His kingdom belongs to you. God will bless you hungry people. You will have plenty to eat. God will bless you people who are crying. You will laugh. God will bless you when others hate you and won't have anything to do with you. God will bless you when people insult you and say cruel things about you all because you are a follower of the Son of Man. Long ago, your people did these same things to the prophets. So when this happens to you, be happy and jump for joy. You will have a great reward in heaven. But you rich people are in for trouble. You, are, you have already had an easy life. You well-fed people, you are in trouble. 
you will go hungry. You people who are laughing now are in trouble, for you are going to cry and weep. You are in trouble when everyone says good things about you. That is what your own people said about those prophets who told lies. Hear the story of God's great love for us. Well, it's no secret that tomorrow is Valentine's Day, the day we celebrate love. And it seems, uh, in particular, the romantic kind of love when we exchange roses and chocolates and uh, all those other goody, goodies. But love has many faces and many expressions, from the fluffy kind you see in Hallmark movies to the deep, grounded, divine love that words cannot describe. We cannot be reminded often enough that loving and learning to love is the work of a lifetime for each of us. So li imagine living in a space with only one window. Your whole world, as you can see it, is through that window. That's your reality. The view is pretty much the same every day with changes as the seasons change and as you watch people or the cars go by. You know there is more going on than that, but you can't see it. You can only imagine it. You think maybe you could put in another window. Maybe you're missing something. We know what we know, but there are always things that we don't know. And there are things we don't know we don't know. So when we put in another window to see a different view, that would be like a paradigm shift. It would be like having a breakthrough while exploring or researching something, or when studying or visiting a different culture or a different time period. Or it could happen when you're experiencing a significant life event. So I thought I'd look up what does a paradigm shift actually mean. Well, it's an important change that happens when the usual way of thinking about something or doing something is replaced by a new and different way. So some examples that are very common is that we've moved from thinking that the Earth is the center of the universe and that the Sun revolves around the Earth to the concept that the Sun is central and that we revolve around the Sun. Or the movement from uh, Newtonian physics to quantum physics, which, you know, some of us still can't get our heads around. Our scriptures too contain examples of paradigm shifts. Jeremiah was a prophet, mainly to the two remaining tribes of what had been 12 tribes. A split occurred in the kingdom after Solomon, where the 10, 10 tribes became the northern kingdom of Israel and the two tribes became the southern kingdom of Judah. The tribes that made up Israel had already been taken captive by the Assyrians earlier and were eventually dispersed to the far corners of the known world. By the time of Jeremiah, Judah also had been taken into exile by the Babylonians. Some of those people, or probably their offspring, eventually came back to their homeland to reestablish themselves. That was the ultimate dream, at least for some. For some people, they were quite content to remain in Babylon eventually. But for some, the dream was to return to their homeland, to their own religious practices and culture, to their God. 
There is no place like home, after all. That's where the heart is. The few times that I was able to uh, go back to my homeland to visit, even though I only spent mm, about eight and a half of my first years there, whenever I do go back, I have a strong sense of home that's hard to describe. Uh, it feels like uh, the recognition of an uh, almost forgotten face. So this particular passage describes a new covenant, a new agreement. It's a new way of living with one another for these people and with their God. It had felt as if God had forsaken them while they were in exile in a foreign land, believing that, only, uh, that God could only be found in Jerusalem. So they needed a way of marking that reunification, of that coming back together after a long separation. Hardship often brings us to our knees, into despair and hopelessness. And after touching bottom, the only way is up. They had a new look on, outlook on life. Perhaps they had come to a greater level of maturity and resilience <clears throat> after their experience. Perhaps they were ready for a new understanding of their relationship with God. They knew they were forgiven. The past was behind them. And they were invited to enter into a new relationship, one that was symbolized by God's promise that in this new way of living was to be written on their hearts and their minds, not on stone tablets. They were commissioned to be heart-centered and to live from that place. And that was for ordinary folks and for rulers alike. No doubt it would still take time for it to truly sink in. That's how new paradigms work. They take time for us to integrate them fully into our hearts and minds. The Gospel reading is uh, Luke's version of the Beatitudes. A huge crowd of followers and curious people had gathered. Many were hoping to be healed of their infirmities. And when Jesus spoke to them, he spoke words of comfort and acknowledgement of their life situations, words of love and acceptance. And with what is an upside down view of the world, Jesus spoke his usual reprimands to those who felt they had already attained success and wealth. He indicated that those who know better must do better. Jesus' version of love is to take for people to take greater responsibility for our words, our actions, and not to take advantage of others. As Jesus usually did, he spoke most hard, harshly to the privileged class, the leadership of the day, who thought they deserved their privilege and were entitled to it for some reason. And essentially, there's, that's very, still very much true today. On a global scale, in many ways, we are the privileged ones. We in the global uh, West, or sometimes called North, have taken most of the world's resources, and we still are. The paradigm shift is the call to do better because we know better. The love Jesus calls for is mature adult love. It's responsible. It's accountable, dependable, and trustworthy. In other words, it's in alignment with divine love. 
Just this past week, I came across a couple of articles that used the word degrowth. Now, even my computer put a red underline under it because <laughs> it's a new word, I guess. And I don't know that much about it, but I think essentially what it's proposing is that rather than have this const uh, mindset of constant growth economically and otherwise, uh, we, that's not sustainable any longer. So we need to look at something like degrowth. And what that'll look like, I don't know. It's just thought I'd put it out there. Hard times make us, sometimes force us, to see differently. The work of love and justice is not finished. The deepening division, the proliferation of opinions expressed, all claiming to be right, the clashes of viewpoints, the anger toward one, anyone who doesn't think the way we do, these are the signs of our times. And the intensity seems to be building based on what's happening. So which side are you on? And what does that even mean? To have a side to choose. To have an opinion, a belief, an ideology that sees from one window and not another. And we all tend to look and, for things or read and listen to things that support what we already believe. It's called confirmation bias, or preaching to the choir. But it seems that families are divided over the in-your-face issues. And this so often, often happens during times of war and crisis. We draw our battle lines and get ready to shoot our arrows, not of love but of animosity. So I ask sometimes, how do we even come to our opinions and beliefs about what's going on? I've spent a lot of time and energy these past couple of years, and probably longer, trying to trace my, my own evolving process and the things that feed into it, of course, um, my life experience, and I can't help but uh, think about what my parents experienced in the Netherlands uh, under Nazi control and what that was like. So those things feed into how our opinions are shaped. As someone whose writing I value said, divisions must be flushed to the surface in order to be healed. The rot must be exposed to the light of day. And listening to the rhetoric, and that's my own as well, there is plenty of rot that needs to emerge, to be revealed and released. Things that have been festering under the service, surface, arising in the form of deep hatred, name-calling, all sorts of things. But they've been suppressed, and now they're coming out. Metaphorically, it reminds me of a volcanic eruption. The pressure and heat coming from deep within the earth needs a release, spewing whatever lies below what we can see. The rot of racism, misogyny, anti-Semitism, Nazism, terrorism, elitism, extremism, left, right. They've all erupted, and the list can go on, as a result of our divisiveness. And that probably goes back to the rot of our ancestral and collective and individual trauma. All the things that we've carried 
with us throughout the centuries and that we globally share. The pain many of us have experienced over the past two years is, not, is no longer hidden from view. We're tired. No, we're exhausted. We're depleted by it all. And truth be told, all of this exposure, this rot that's coming to the surface, it's necessary. It all needs to see the light of day. No longer hidden, no longer able to be masked or covered up. No longer prettied up and given some kind of justification. So we need a lot of new windows to look out of in every discipline. We need a new window in how we perceive love, mature, adult love. We've hit too many brick walls with our opinions and beliefs and choices. There's no returning to normal or to what was or what we thought was. We may want to go back to Jerusalem, but Jerusalem has been destroyed and we have to rebuild it. Perhaps what we need to do instead of opening more windows is just to break down, <clears throat> break down those walls and forget about our different views. Perhaps we need a whole panoramic view that rises above opposition and division and separation. We're the ones who create these. And we all want to be right, and none of us are. Opinions are merely views or judgments formed about something not necessarily based in fact or knowledge. And none of us is privy to all the facts and all the knowledge. We need to let our hearts lead and allow mind to follow. And when the messes are clear, cleared up, when the rot has been exposed, and I'm sure there's more to come, we may be ready for a reunification, a new agreement and a new covenant a new covenant with the source of all that is, everything in the known universe. The new world needs to find also new words to use. I've used one, degrowth. But there's words like regeneration, a different way of farming, Reunion, collaboration, partnership, connection, all under the panorama of love. And new ideas are emerging and have been. Paradigms have shifted in the world of science and biology, for example. We have the field of epigenics, where um, the belief changed from the belief that uh, the cell's brain is the nucleus to actual, it's the cell membrane that uh, determines what comes in and leaves the cell. So what comes out of that is that disease is determined more by the environment than by genetics. and the huge study that's happening with the microbiome of our more than 30 trillion cells, less than half of those are actually human cells. The rest are a garden variety of bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, uh, all kinds. And they live in us and they live everywhere around us. We're not sterile like we once thought. 
And when the balance of these wonderful microorganisms, when they, when they get out of balance, and that can happen by stress or poor nutrition or a deficiency of some kind, pollution, toxicity in the environment, that's when we're prone to get sick. So the world we are creating, and we are creating a new world, I do believe that. That new world will look very different, maybe unrecognizably so. And maybe we won't see it in our lifetime. But it begins today by making new choices about many things. And it begins in our hearts, that place where love lives and grows and expands. Growth is not a bad thing when it comes to love. Perhaps the reason that heart disease is the number one killer is that it cries out for love, self-love, other love, and beyond, God love. The Sufi poet Rumi says, your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. So we can take down those obstacles, the walls and the constructs of our minds, the blockades that fear breeds. As we grow up, we learn to take responsibility for our lives, for our choices, for our perceptions, and which window we look through. And that is the task we face today. There's a word that the, comes out of this Zulu um, tradition, and that word is Ubuntu. And that word translates, I am because you are. I am because we are. Division can only be healed by love. And may it be so. Amen. Let's come together in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we acknowledge the privilege we have of abundant living, where most of us have more than enough for life and well-being. We offer our sincere gratitude for the gifts we often take for granted. We acknowledge that we are prone to complain and worry about what might be lacking in our lives. Help us to recognize our tendency to put obstacles between you and us, between one another, between us and the created world around us. Help us to realize when we put limits on our generosity and compassion. Teach us to be willing to explore a different view than the one we are comfortable with, a new way of possible change, the unveiling of what is possible when we work together with a common goal. We turn now to the people we know, in family, in our community, we know there are many concerns and needs. We know there is illness, isolation, great stress, and grief. There are feelings of despair and anxiety and even hopelessness. In this moment, we lay the names silently before you.
Give us the courage to hold on to faith and hope and above all, love. Allowing people to be where they are and at the same time offering our healing presence to them as a support and encourager. Help us also to know when to ask for help when we need it. We pray this prayer with Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'll invite you to stand for our hymn, number 670, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Thank you, Pam. Go from this place with new eyes and new vision for what is possible, as all things are possible with God. And may the Creator bless us with a creative heart and mind. May the universal Christ bless us with a universal, universal vision of love. May the movement and energy of spirit renew our spirits every day. Amen.